you for, for inviting me to come here and speak uh, in the great country of China, uh, for which I have much admiration, as you will see, uh, for which I have much admiration and also have had the great pleasure of visiting irregularly for the last 35 years. I was in China the first time in 1978 when the Gang of Four was still in power and I established the first management school uh, in China in 1985 in Beijing. Uh, so, and then I've been here on and on, so my feeling is that I know your great country better than many other Westerners. Uh, my perspective uh, on, on uh, uh, any issue is formed, as the meeting leader indicated, from participating in writing the book The Limits to Growth uh, 40 years ago. And this book convinced me of one thing, uh, and that is that the world is small. The world is surprisingly little compared to humanity and compared to our activity. And that the main problem of the world is to try to fit human activity onto this tiny planet. We are very many people and we have a huge ecological footprint per person. You know, each person uses a lot of resources and emits a lot of pollution, particularly my countrymen, you know, but others do the same thing. Uh, and the sum is huge and the problem is basically to fit all of this onto the, the tiny planet. So the problem is to keep expanding humanity and our activity level without using up the resources, without polluting the air, without creating uh, global warming and without uh, eradicating uh, biodiversity. In order to do those two things, there are two strategies that are available. One is to reduce the population and the other one is to reduce the ecological footprint per person. And since we are so late in the day, we have spent 40 years now talking about this, doing little, we are now left in a situation where we have to do both. You know, both see to that the population growth rate comes down and ideally that the population starts declining. And the second one is to reduce the ecological footprint per person. That means reducing the resource use per person, reducing the emissions uh, per person. In spite of my effort for, and my colleagues' efforts over the last 40 years, you know, to try to move the world in a sustainable uh, direction, uh, very little has happened. You know, the world is much, much less sustainable at this point in time uh, than we started uh, working 40 years ago. Uh, and this is easiest to see in the climate area where we're emitting into the atmosphere twice as much CO2 every year as is being absorbed by the oceans and the forests of the world. The rest is accumulating in the atmosphere and uh, increasing the temperature. And this will, of course, continue until we stop emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. So a couple of years ago, uh, I decided I wanted to try to find out what will actually happen over the next 40 years. So instead of making recommendations about what people ought to do, and keep talking to people who do not listen you know, to what I say, I said, OK, let me turn it around and try to find out what will actually happen you know, in the next 40 years when people continue to behave their traditional way. And the result is uh, in this book called 2052, which appeared a couple of years ago and is now available in nine languages in 100,000 copies. So it's at least starting to, to, to be read by some, particularly outside the uh, United States and, and uh, the UK. And, and uh, here I basically tried to, to make a forecast of what will happen to population developments over the next 40 years and what will happen to economic developments over the next year is 40 years. In other words, trying to see what will happen to the population and what will happen to the ecological footprint per person. You know, how much resources will we use? How much pollution will we generate uh, each of us over the next 40 years? 
And the conclusion, the main graph in, in the new book is this one, which basically says that what will happen over the next 40 years is that yes, there will be more people and yes, there will be a bigger economy. Uh, and yes, there will be technological advance, and yes, there will be an attempt at reducing greenhouse gases, but it will not suffice. And so the CO2 emissions of the world are going to continue to increase for another 20 years, and then they will reach a peak uh, in the middle uh, around 2030, and by 2050 it will be back down to current levels. This type of emission scenario, this is of course much worse than what is currently being desired, namely a cut in global CO2 emissions by 50 to 80 percent by 2050. So it is easy to calculate how warm is it going to be in my scenario, and it is actually going to be plus 2 degrees centigrade in 2050, and plus 3 degrees centigrade in, in 2080, you know, outside uh, this graph. So in other words, uh, <laughs> Not only have humanity overshot already the limits of the planet, but we're moving uh, forwards into a situation where we're going to create stronger and stronger climate problems for ourselves. So this is a scenario where the average temperature increases gradually over the next 40 years, meaning that we get more and more extreme weather, more storms, more drought, more floods, uh, you know, slight sea level rise, etc., etc. A very problematic uh, future, and it could become a crisis in the second half of the century. If this warming melts the permafrost, then we get a boost of methane into the atmosphere, which might actually create a runaway uh, temperature change, much larger than the plus, plus two to three degrees, which is likely. So in short, Humanity, in my mind, from my perspective, is in deep trouble. We have been digging ourselves into a, a, a rather difficult situation over the last 40 years. How will this play out? You know, what will happen uh, over the next 40 years in some more detail? Please read my book. There is 400 pages which describe this in detail. There are two aspects that I need to mention because they are directly related to urbanization and then the rest uh, you have to do uh, at your convenience. The first uh, point is that the world population is actually going to peak much earlier than most people think. We will only reach 8 <laughs> billion people in 2040 and then the world population will stagnate more or less uh, at that time at the middle of the century and start a slow decline in the uh, second half. This will happen uh, not because uh, anyone decides to do so. This will happen because uh, women of the world will choose to continue the fabulous reduction in the number of children per woman that we have been through over the last 40 years. 40 years ago, the average woman had uh, uh, three and a half uh, so at this point in time, they have two and a half children on average, and in my forecast, I expect this to go down to one and a half children. Uh, and this is largely, you know, of course, because of education of women and because of contraception and because of, 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 of the important fact that increasing number of women choose to have a career rather than having more children. The GDP uh, of the world is also going, the growth of the GDP of the world is also going to be much slower over the next 40 years than most people expect. And, and uh, this is a combination of two things. In the rich world, in the OECD world, in the currently industrialized world, there will hardly be any growth over the next 40 years. Uh, and that's very important to understand that, that the rich world what you have seen over the last 10 years will continue for the next 40. The blue-collar workers in the United States have not received a raise, a pay raise, of, since 1980, roughly, and this will continue. They will have more or less the same low purchasing power for the next 40 years. And the reason for this, uh, while uh, emerging economies like China will do spectacularly over the next 40 years, they will grow, they will 
follow Japan and South Korea in the effort to just catch up with, with the high productivity levels of the Western world. And by 2050, we will be in a situation where uh, China is as rich on a per capita basis as Europe and the, and the United States will have declined more or less to European levels. And so that uh, will be the situation. The poor world, the poor democracies of the world, in my mind, will not do well at all and will remain poor in this period. The sum total is that the world GDP in 2050 will be roughly twice as big as the world GDP today, not four times as big which it would have been if we had continued traditional growth rates of 3.5% a year. So there will be a dramatic slowdown, particularly in the rich world. Why is this happening in the rich world? And that's important to understand. This is because from now on, most of the labor force in the rich world works in services, health and care. And productivity growth in those sectors is much, much lower than it is in agriculture and manufacturing particularly. So although there will be rapid productivity growth as we robotize manufacturing in the West, you know, there are hardly any people there. So that, that's production that will go on without people. Most of the people will be in, 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 in services and care where there is little productivity growth and as a consequence the GDP will not grow. Uh, could this be changed? Could this future... Uh, sorry, I... Sh uh, I did. Uh, just to illustrate, here is the Chinese version. The book contains forecasts for each of the five important regions of the world, and here is the China one. With a population which stays more or less stable, but declining, GDP grows spectacularly, the CO2 emissions of the country grows even more spectacularly to a peak in 2030, the temperature keeps rising, and the consumption levels you know, go up dramatically. You know, the average Chinese is going to consume of the order of five times as much in, in, in 2050 as today. Could this future be changed? You know, so we are actually, you know growing in a certain manner, creating problems for itself? And the answer is yes. It is very simple for humanity to choose to do the necessary investments in order to reduce CO2 emissions. It costs of the order. It's technologically possible, you know, to insulate homes and to change to other cars and to uh, increase energy efficiency in industry and to build renewable capacity much faster than the market chooses to do so at this point in time. And all the calculations show that if we were willing to use 2% of the GDP, that means 2% of the labor force and 2% of the capital and 2% of the energy to clean the world, it would be done. You know, so it's a tiny cost to solve the problem. But since it costs more than doing nothing, you know, most societies will choose to do nothing. And particularly the democratic societies where the voters are you know, de deciding what to do. They are not willing to incur an extra cost at this point in time in order to get an uncertain benefit for children and grandchildren 30 to 60 years into the future. And this holds the most of the world back. So the only hope are for the slightly or the semi-authoritarian regimes of the world where some wise uh, men and women could conceivably overrule the people and start working for the long run. But I don't think this will happen very much and consequently we will run into the climate crisis. So what is the consequences? What does all of this mean for urbanization? And it means, of course, a whole lot. So I've had to try to limit myself to five important things. And then I'll have one more slide, which says what should be done. Uh, and, and that is essentially it. The first thing which is important is, of course, that in this future, urbanization will continue. That means that everyone who tries to increase the consumption level of their nation will see that the population concentrates more and more and more into big uh, megacities. 
And of course, the, the role model is the rich world where you have a high degree of urbanization. And in China, you know, this will be the end situation where you have this high percentage of the population in the urban area. This is necessary in order to maintain the high productivity in, in certain sectors. And it is desirable from the point of view of most inhabitants who much prefer to live in a big city over living in the village. The second one is exceedingly important and normally disregarded completely. Employment will shift over this period. You know, it will continue to shift. It shifted initially from agriculture into manufacturing. As we increased productivity in agriculture, we could produce enough food with, with a few people. We move them into manufacturing. Then we are in the full process of adding machinery energy, computers, robots, increase the productivity in manufacturing, we can manage with much fewer people in manufacturing. So we move them into simple office work, into the banking sector, finance sector, into producing of services. Here, the computers are going to come. And you know, make it, banks in 20 years will probably not have a single employee. This will be run by big computers. And so the people are free to start working in real uh, services, entertainment and education and uh, you know, other things like this. And then in the end, the real absorber of all the capacity is of course health and old care and child care and sick care. Uh, you know. So this is what is going on. And when you're planning a city on a 40-year horizon, you must not do the mistake of assuming that this means increasing the industrial workforce of this city. I mean, as the income level of this city and the nation increases, you know, the workforce moves into these other sectors. So be aware of the shift in the economic structure as, economics, uh, as the GDP increases and as urbanization increases. And it's important to remember that jobs move much faster than GDP because the robots that are left in manufacturing produces a lot of value. You know, but the people are not there. This, this value is created without the use of, of, of employment. And so the GDP goes up, but the number of positive jobs do not go up. This is what you see in the United States and in, the, in Europe over the last decade. GDP going up, employment staying more or less stable. But it's important to understand the very deep root of, of that phenomenon because it will take decades before people understand that this is what's going on in the public debate and in the policy debate. Uh, three, the urban population will age. But it is an interesting fact that, you know, if you put up a big fence around a city, it would age very quickly. But those fences hardly exist. And so all the immigrants from the villages will move into, the, and in our, even in our rich country, from the rural area will continue moving out in and they are younger than the ones that live in the city and consequently the aging will not be as fast as many people think. Uh, fourth, pollution levels will rise. You know, there is, <laughs> if you increase uh, the economic level uh, at a given technology, you know, pollution levels will rise. And the only way to handle pollution is through collective action. It is you cannot simply wait until it becomes profitable to fight pollution. You know, in China, we are just now at a stage where you can see this happening, that we have been hoping that it is going to become profitable to put money into fighting air pollution. Uh -uh. This does not happen until much, much later in economic development. Uh, as you saw in the United States, they didn't clear the air in Los Angeles until at an income level which was three to four times above what China has at this point in time. So what you need to do in order to clean the air is basically to tax the people and then use the money to employ people to clean the air. So you are actually sacrificing consumption growth in order to get a cleaner environment. So pollution levels will rise until stopped by collective action. And the fifth comment is what I understand you discussed yesterday, this is my version, successful cities will be flooded by immigrants. 
you know, if you manage to do what cities want to do, all of them want to do, namely to increase this, the quality of life in the city, the only effect, sorry, one effect is that for a moment, yes, there is high quality of life, and then, of course, all the immigrants come, you know, and destroying the quality of life. This is uh, a big problem, very difficult to solve, but it can be solved through wise uh, policy, I think. And one should be aware of the fact that it is that the city is more climate efficient than uh, and energy efficient than the village. It is also much safer, you know, when the storms start hitting uh, the village. And so you will have this added immigration pressure coming from the extreme weather in the in the rest of the society. People feel more safe if they are together. And yes, it is easier to build a dome over a city than it is to try to protect individual farms and villages around. So these are five important consequences of, of my worldview, you know, uh, on, on uh, urbanization. And finally, uh, the list to what are concrete actions, I mean, if so what to do. And I think the important thing, the most important thing is number one. Remember that the goal is to make the citizens happy, not only the financial elite, not only the owners, not only those that benefit from GDP growth. It's the average person's welfare, well-being that ought to be uh, increased. And the only way to start a move in this direction is to start measuring the subjectively reported well-being of people so that they get the opportunity to tell you whether they're happy or not. You shouldn't ask how rich they are or how big, how many square meters of building they have or whether they have a car or whatever. You should just ask them, you know, on a scale from zero to ten, you know, what is your subjectively reported well-being? And you will then discover that in order to get a meaningful response, you have to answer compared to what. So you have to ask them, how is your well-being this year compared to five years ago? And what do you think your well-being is now compared to what it will be in five years' time? So what you actually measure is how satisfied people are with development. So you get the... F you get you should aim for a situation where a majority of the citizens are of the view that things have gotten better over the last five years and will get better over the next five years. And when you start thinking about it, it is not only by increasing the income that you can increase the well-being of a citizen. In Japan, to take an example, if you were willing to give the Japanese another week of vacation, you know, next year, at the same salary, they would be much, much, much happier than if you gave them. And this goes, of course, for the United States of America also, which unbelievably has kept the same length of the work year since I went to school at MIT in the early 1970s. Whereas my country of Norway has reduced the number of hours worked per year by roughly 30% in the same period. And we are the richest in the world, and, and the Americans are slightly less rich. So this is, this is uh, highly doable to increase well-being without increasing income. Number two, try to limit the size of the urban population. And there are, of course, things that can be done. If I had a long time, I could uh, enter into how to do this. But So find policies that reduce fertility so that the endogenous population reduces the number of uh, children per woman, and then also do something with the in-migration. This logic, the starting point here is that if you do not restrict in migration into a successful city, it will not stay successful until you have solved all the problems for all of the nation. So I think one should rather have the idea that this city is going to be a role model. It's going to develop the quality of life for its citizens in a way that can be copied by other cities elsewhere. Number three, reduce the footprint per person. This means increase energy efficiency, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce the resource use. These are, you know, introduce the circular economy. These are the standard things that most people actually believe in at this point in time. Then comes number four, which is 
again terribly important and uh, is related to this discussion going on in the free zone uh, department above our heads. It is a tacit understanding that the more you export, the better. You know, that the more you rely, the more you trade, the better. I don't think that is true. I think that you should choose the correct size of the export sector of the city. So you should have an export city which sector which is exactly big enough for you to pay for what you want to import. And of course this is so this is of course a very deep discussion and very complicated and relies on a lot of goals but at least choose the correct size you know according to your goals and your ambitions is that the fourth most important thing you can do. And then finally, I've already mentioned this, that accept that high taxes are necessary to manage an urban area well. And this is the, uh, and the main point is that it, there is not perfect alignment between what is profitable as seen from an investor point of view and what is in the social interest. You know, we know this in the area of military, we have known this for the last 200 years that yes, we have to tax people in order to keep the fence. The fence is not profitable in itself in the short term. But this applies to a large number of sectors in the urban area, public transport, airlines, uh, you know, the whole schmear. And the only way to accelerate the, the, the building of the city according to a plan you know, not according to profitability, is through taxation. And, and so, although the voter does not like this, you know, uh, this ought to be the message communicated by intelligent scholars and politicians. So public interest, not profitability, should steer, uh, govern uh, a share of the investment flow towards building the city. And if the Communist Party of China is going to, to proceed in the direction it is proceeding, which is gradually to increase its membership and gradually to relinquish control to the market. It should keep one main control, and that is, say, the control with 50% of the investment flow in Chinese society, so that at least one half of the investments are used to build society according to a plan rather than going after the most profitable project. Uh, I am done. Uh, I just want to end on a positive note that this is of course very complicated issues and particularly in democratic society you know, it's, it's close to impossible to reach agreement on, on any of these things and we will not and consequently very little will happen uh, on this course but here at least is what should happen and and uh, china is of course in the middle of this process L luckily they have some role models there are other nations that have moved through those decades that china is going to move through over the next uh, several decades and the good news I can report to you is something that will be announced in Beijing on the 10th of June. Uh, so Norway has helped uh, the Chinese Academy of Science and Technology for Economic Development, which is a 300-man think tank in, 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 in um, Beijing, to, to make sustainability indicators for China. And we have worked on this for four years and on Tuesday, I think it is, or the 10th of June. They, this, these will be launched. And I'll give you a peak view on <laughs> one of the most interesting things that uh, have happened. Because we have de devised the well-being index. And we have asked 30,000 Chinese, you know, all over China. 30,000. This is not a small poll. This is 30,000 people. We have asked, you know, how happy are you today? How does this com compare to five years ago? And how, what do you think will happen over the next uh, five years? So I know, and I'll show you, how many percent, and this is, so we took the 30,000, then we stratified according to the population characteristics of China. So we have exactly the right distribution between party members and non-party members, rural people, you know, urban people, rich people, poor people, the whole schmear, education levels. And so I know the answer. How large a fraction do you think of the Chinese answer that, yes, things today are better than five years ago, and yes, things will be better five years into the future? 
So think about that number, and uh, I'll tell you the number in a second. So this is the, so 63% of Chinese, two thirds of all the Chinese, says that the world, uh, that uh, their standard of living is better uh, than uh, five, it's better than five years ago, and it will be better in, in five years. 6% says same, same. 2% says worse, worse. So you are in a situation where there is a solid uh, view uh, that things are actually getting better in spite of all the complaints, etc. For the fun of it, I ask the same question in Norway. Norway is, of course, of the order of 10 times as rich as, as, as China is at this point in time on a per capita basis. Our real income per capita has gone up by 3% a year so over the last decade. So we are 30% richer now than we were 10 years ago. And we were t stinking rich 10 years ago. And so now we are stinking, stinking rich. They asked the same question in Norway. How many Norwegians do you think? S answer, better, better. You know that they're better off now than five years ago and will be better off uh, five years in the future. What do you think? What did you say? Huh? Yeah, fine, you're getting the point. <laughs> so in Norway, 26%, so one quarter of the population says, and of course, the situation as you get, as you get very rich is that most people say that it's, it will be the same, it will be the same shit, you know, in five years' time as it was five years ago. You know, they basically say that that's the way it is. So, interesting. Conclusion, difficult issues, time to start working. Thank you. <laughs>